says the word that is Jesus Christ became flesh and dwelt among us. God sent his son to this earth to dwell among us. And it's such a good reminder as we enter into this Advent season, the anticipation of the coming, how the earth must have felt, how Mary and Joseph must have felt anticipating the coming of Christ. And we can be reminded of that in this season, that he is with us now, that he has left his spirit here, his Holy Spirit to walk alongside us, to fill us, to guide us, and to lead us. And we can rest in that, in his holiness today. I wanna to welcome you to worship. Welcome for, to those of you who are joining us online. We're so glad that you decided to worship with us today. And for those of you who are in the room, welcome. Why don't you go ahead and stand? as we continue to sing out that truth this morning. This is holy, this is holy ground. You are holy, you are holy God. Come on, we declare it today. This is holy, this is holy ground. You are holy, you are with me now. Oh, 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 oh. my heart cries holy. That's our prayer, Lord, that we would that we would wait on you, that we would acknowledge your presence, Lord, not just in this place right now, but in our lives. God, your word says that you inhabit the praises of your people. God, so we know that you are here. We thank you for your presence. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen, church. Well, let's continue to worship the Lord this morning. He is worthy of our praise. Yeah. Here is 
presence in this room. May we encounter you in a new way today. Would, would you shake up the ground of all our tradition as we hear your word, as we gather together in this place. May your presence be known. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Before you grab a seat, why don't you turn to your neighbor and greet someone. Tell them the best thing you ate for Thanksgiving.
Well, good morning. My name is Grace Stevenson, and I have the pleasure of serving on staff as our middle school ministry director. Whether you're joining us here in person or you find yourself online, we're so glad you're here. I want to extend a special welcome to our kids and students joining us in the room. If you see any around you, give them a high five. Tell them you're so glad that they're here. If you're new in this place, we, we want to welcome you as well. Here at Christ Church, we do something called Christ Church in Five. I'll be in front of the platform here after the service, and we just want to welcome you, hear more of your story, and help in a big church make, make it feel a little smaller and help you find your sense of community here. If you can't stay after, that's no problem. We have cards in the seat backs in front of you that you can fill out and someone from our team will reach out to you later this week. If you're new online, you can just say, I'm new in the chat and someone will connect with you that way. If you join us after the service and are willing to talk to me for a few minutes, we'll give you a coupon for your troubles. Um, there's a lot going on here um, in this church. December is a busy time of month, believe it or, or not. It's already almost December. The snow is evidence of that. We have a lot going on, like I said, and you can pick up our December card on your way out today. And I just want to point your attention to a few things you can read for yourself otherwise. Next week, we start our Advent series called Magical. Advent is the time of the year in the church calendar where we celebrate the coming of the birth of Jesus. The Magical series will be awesome. Come back. You won't want to miss it this Sunday. Next Saturday from about 10 to 2, correct me if I'm wrong, we have our Oh What Fun Christmas Party. This is replacing our old spirit village with a lot of the same joy of the season behind it. This is a great event to invite your friends and your family and others who might not otherwise find themselves walking through the doors of our church or, or any church at all. Lastly, in terms of Christmas, Every year in the past, we've donated Christmas shoe boxes. Raise your hand if, if you're familiar with, with that old, old tradition. My family grew up buying shoe boxes and stuffing them together as a way to support and lift children and families in this community. This year, our mission team went back to our mission partners and said, what is a step further we can go to, to really support the mission that, that you guys are all about in your community? And they responded and said, what about giving specific gifts as a way to really, really bless those in our community? Specific gifts for, for a child. And so we said yes, and so you can go online and purchase a gift from the registry, or you can reserve one and then go purchase it in the store and bring it here. And we said that we'll give a 1,000 gifts, and we still have about 500 or 600 to go, but I'm confident that us as a church community can rally to really, really make an impact in the lives of our mission partners and the people they serve. So, so maybe consider on your way out picking up something off the registry and bringing it back by, by this coming Saturday. Like I said, there's a lot going on. I hope you get a glimpse of that. God is on the move in really, really powerful ways in the life of our church. I'm privileged to, to be on staff and get to have a front row seat to that. Sometimes it's in the little, small moments. Other times we get a glimpse of God's goodness in the big picture of someone's life. The ways where he has shown up faithfully through the lives of people in this church for, for his glory. And so I want you to turn your attentions to the screen as we hear one of these stories. I'm Cindy Campbell, and I came to Christ Church back in the 70s. It was during and after a lot of abuse, domestic abuse with my family, and I was coming as a college student. You know, I lived a life of believing a lot of lies about myself, and for me, I need to hear the truth. It was the truth of the gospel that was continuing to bring me back. And the embrace that I got from the entire church, just everybody coming around, supporting me and just being there for me. I was so introverted that when I would come to church, I would basically come in into the back pew and sit there and then exit before everybody else went out because there was such a deep hole in my heart that I needed to hear the word. I am involved in small groups and I've realized that everybody is walking through their own stories with God leading and I really I'm glad to know that I'm not the only one that was going through what I was going through. 
About 10 years ago, I was in a dark, dark place in my life, and I was coming to church. There was an announcement that there was only one spot left on the disaster relief team to go to Joplin, Missouri for a rebuild. And I no more than left the church. God, God nudged me and said, Cindy, I want you to go on that. It touched my heart so much to realize that, yes, I had been through a lot of things in my life, but these people have also been through a disaster. Whenever I have an opportunity to serve others, I find that it's much better for me to take my focus off of myself and my problems, what I'm dealing with, and fix my eyes on Jesus and just ask him where I can be his hands and feet. So I've been to numerous uh, disaster relief sites and I end up coming back more blessed than I feel I blessed them. So many people have poured into my life that I feel like if I can just take the little things that I can do and pour them into other people's lives, they will be blessed as I have been. I have been so lifted by the family feel of this church. This is the family that I never had. So I am just thrilled to be one small part in, in this family. I chose to make a commitment because I have received so much from the ministry of this church. I want to be able to pour out that which I've been given. I'm at the point in my life where I would like to be able to bless the next generation, to let young people know Jesus loves them. They don't have to go through life alone. And God just has called them into the family as well and wants them to know him personally. I want to take a second just to thank you guys for being a part of the family and the stories that, that we hear from, from Cindy. If you don't know Cindy Campbell, she is one of the kindest, most loving people in the world, and she makes a mean batch of chocolate chip cookies. And I guarantee if you asked, she would make you, she would bake you a batch. Thank you so much for, for helping make stories like these possible. And I wonder what it might look like to continue to reflect on how we give of ourselves and our time and our talents and our treasures to lift others in this community and beyond the walls of this church as we give his tithes and our offerings. enough words I'll never live enough lifetimes to fully know your worth to know all that you deserve all of my affection everything I have to give the sum of my attention is measured in the praise I live and this is how I thank the Lord for saving me when I was weak. So I will sing. This is how I thank the Lord for everything. This is why I thank the Lord. All of my affection, everything I have to give, the sum of my attention is measured in the praise I live. This is how I thank the Lord for saving me when I was weak. So I will sing. This is how I thank the Lord for everything. This is how I thank the Lord. This is how I thank the Lord for loving me and keeping me. So I will sing. This is how I thank the Lord for everything. This is how sing, I will sing, I will lift my praises to you. I will sing, I will sing, I will lift my praises to you. I will sing, I will sing, I will lift my praises to you. I will sing, I will sing. 
This is how I thank the Lord for saving me when I was weak. So I will sing. This is how I thank the Lord for everything. This is how I thank the Lord. 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 Amen. Amen. Well, as we continue in worship, why don't you turn your attention to the screen as we join Pastor Dan Meyer in the sanctuary. It is a very special pleasure this morning to be talking with our entire church family, uh, with those of you who are here in our sanctuary today, those in our auditorium, and those at our Butterfield campus as well, as we conclude a 12-week study of the great, great book of Exodus in the Old Testament that we have entitled Wild. And I hope and pray that just this chance to systematically journey with the people of God uh, through their uh, travails and their triumphs under the hand of a provident God has been something that has given you takeaways, insights, uh, perspectives, and assurances that will uh, last long beyond the series. But it's my privilege today to bring it to a close and to invite us to look together at the very final chapters of the book of Exodus. And uh, as we prepare to do that, let me just invite us to bow our heads uh, once more before the Lord. And now, God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight and advance your good purposes through us, we pray. For we ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Raise your hand if you watched a little bit of football the last couple of days. <laughs> we even got a new television in our house so we could do that even more effectively. And it was just an, a lot of fun to gather with our kids and our friends and to be able to share in uh, just the great adventure that the game of football can be. And it reminded me of a story that I had read earlier in this week, not planning to make the connection to Thanksgiving football, but the story was a striking one, and I want to share it with you. It comes from an earlier era. Uh, the story is about a novelist and a film writer named Lawrence Stallings who took an unusual assignment uh, as a sports writer for a day. Uh, he uh, stepped into a role that was not familiar to him, and he was asked to cover a football game between the University of Pennsylvania and the University of Illinois. The year was 1925. On the field that particular day was a brilliant three-time All-American halfback from Wheaton by the name of Red Grange. Some of us will remember that name. Some of us, this is brand new. While at Wheaton High School, Red Grange earned 16 varsity letters for uncommon performance in football, baseball, basketball, and track. In 1923, Red Grange led the Fighting Illini to the national championship in football. And then the very next year, in a game against the highly vaunted Michigan Wolverines, they had a good day yesterday, uh, Red Grange turned the kickoff, returned the kickoff 95 yards for a touchdown, and then in the next 12 minutes, scored three more touchdowns. And I'm not even going to tell you about the second half, it was even more amazing. No less than an authority than ESPN would one day name Red Grange the greatest college football player of all time. On this particular afternoon, in 1925, Grange was not only in the game, he was redefining the game. On an impossibly muddy field, the galloping ghost as Red was nicknamed, 
floated across the field like some kind of supernatural entity that no one could contain. Gangs of opponents could not seem to bring him down as he broke loose for touchdown after touchdown after touchdown. And up in the press box, the veteran sports writers there were pounding out their stories at their typewriters, recording the stunning performance for the next day's newspapers, but not Lawrence Stalling. Stalling was the only one not sitting down recording the story. Instead, Stalling's superb storytelling mind, remember he was a film writer and, and a novelist and author, was, was overcome by the incredible narrative that he was witnessing and, and the wonder that was happening on that field, the sheer magnificence of, magnificence of all of this was just blowing Stalling's circuits. And he was pacing up and down in the press box. And with his hands clasped to his head, Stallings wailed, I can't, I can't write it. It's too big. It's just too big. I tell you this tale because the story that I am going to try to cover with you today to close out this series of messages is, is big. <laughs> in fact, too big in a sense to really do justice to it. You will have to go back and study these chapters for yourself. Uh, you'll need to go back, I think, to chapter 25 and then read all the way to the end of chapter 40 to get the full picture. I'm going to try and help orient you to this by inviting you to go galloping with me across a field of, of 16 chapters from the end of Exodus 24 all the way to the end of the whole book of Exodus at chapter 40. When we pick up the story of Exodus this week, the man we call Moses the uncommon individual that God chose to lead his people uh, toward the promised land has, has just had his own mind-blowing experience too. Uh, God had called Moses into a personal encounter with him. It was an encounter in which God would give to Moses the famous Ten Commandments, uh, which are certainly amongst the most influential precepts in all of human history. It, these precepts changed human history. But even more dramatically and even more importantly, God will give to Moses an up-close and personal experience of what Scripture calls the glory of God. God's glory. Now we're told that when Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it and the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. The Bible says that to the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire on top of the mountain. It was a ghostly cloud of flame and smoke that Moses entered into and stayed in the midst of for 40 days and 40 nights, the Bible says. By the way, whenever the Bible mentions a, a period of, of time that involves a 40, whether it's 40 years or 40 days and 40 nights, uh, whether it's the time that Noah spends in the ark or the Israelites spent in the wilderness or Jesus spent out in the desert being tempted, this, this, this term of time is usually more of a theological statement than it is a chronological statement. It's shorthand, it's Bible speak for a time sufficient for God to accomplish his purposes. A time sufficient, not a short time usually, but a sufficient time for God to accomplish his good purposes. But back to the glory thing. When you hear that word glory, what comes to mind for you? <coughs> what, what do you think of when you hear the term glory? Today, we often associate glory with the idea of 
of fame or uh, credit <coughs> or celebrity, as in the way a football player or other famous person gets the glory for performing well. When the Bible speaks of the glory of the Lord, it's talking about something almost too big to get one's head around personally. Uh, the very concept of glory is meant to shatter perception. And it does actually shatter the boxes of our perceptions. The word glory is simply uh, how we describe the summary effect of all of God's attributes. Of his grace, his truth, goodness, mercy, justice, knowledge, power, eternity. All that God is, is summed up in that word glory. <coughs> in his book... The Purpose Driven Life, uh, author and pastor Rick Warren writes, and I quote, that glory is who God is. God's glory is the essence of his nature. It's the weight of his importance. It's the radiance of his splendor, the demonstration of his power, and the atmosphere of his presence. It is the expression of his goodness remember that, and all his other intrinsic eternal qualities. And by intrinsic, Rick Warren means that glory is to God as light is to the sun, as wet is to water, or this morning, as cold is to snowflakes. In other words, it's in him and it is of him. Human glory is not like this. Human glory is not intrinsic, it's extrinsic. For example, if you take a member of the British royal family, and you can pick the one you might bring to mind. If you removed their robes and their crown and you gave them only rags to wear and you left them out on the streets of London for several weeks and then you put them next to a beggar, you might actually struggle to discern which is which? It might be difficult to discern who is the royal. Why? Because there's no intrinsic glory to an aristocrat. The glory that human beings have is granted to them by others. The glory that is God's, however, is his essence. You cannot de-glory God because glory is his nature. It can't be taken away. <coughs> it cannot be added to. It is his very being. God's glory is the most beautiful, awesome, reorienting reality in all of the universe. To truly behold that glory is to have your life irrevocably changed by that encounter. And in Exodus chapter 33, Moses actually asks God, he says, show me your glory. Show me all of who you are. My friend John Ortberg inquires, have you ever asked God that? Have you ever asked God to really reveal to you his glory? If you were God, writes John, what would you show Moses in that moment? Would you show him thunder and lightning? Would you show him a tremendous earthquake or huge galaxies or special effects of some kind? No, God said. I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you. In other words, the most glorious thing about God is not his cataclysmic power. The most glorious thing about God is not his sin-searing holiness. The most glorious thing about God is how good he is. How intensely, magnificently 
good God is. His stunning humility, his tremendous kindness and compassion, his overwhelming grace and mercy, his staggering generosity and perseverance with people, his redeeming love. This is God's glory. This is what is most glorious. This is his nature. God continues in his encounter with Moses and says, you cannot see my face, which I take to mean here, you cannot uh, take in the total fullness of who I am, for now one may see me and live. Why is this so? I I think actually that's a typo. No one may see me fully and live is what God says. I suspect this is because God's gloriousness, his glory, is too big. It's just too big for us if we met it unmediated in some way. If we saw every bit of God, it would melt us or explode us. It would be like downloading the contents of the universe's greatest heart or supreme mind into the circulatory or the nervous system of an ant. The universe's intelligence and power downloaded into an ant. How could the ant survive it? It would destroy the creature. So in his kindness, God mediates his nature to us. In this story, God hides Moses in the cleft of a rock. He covers him with his hand to protect him. It's a beautifully intimate image. And he gives Moses just a quick glimpse of the very back of his glory. Just a little peek at the immensity of the goodness of God. And we're told later in chapter 34 that when Moses came down from Mount Sinai with the second copy of the Ten Commandments, the Israelites noticed he had been changed by the encounter. His face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. How wonderful would it be if each time we left this place of worship, we emerged into the world and the everyday of life again with a greater radiance because of that encounter we'd had. How marvelous if the communion had been so deep for us, we had been so open to the wonder of who it was we were relating to that, that we simply glowed in a way that others would begin to notice. Do you ever see that glorious radiance in me? Is it ever upon your face? There's a a story in, in chapter 32 where the Israelites get tired for, of waiting for Moses to come down from the mountain. Uh, and this is amazing to me. Uh, when I think about all of the encounters they've already had with the great and the glorious God, how he liberated them from slavery in Egypt, how he took them across the Red Sea and parted the waters for them, how he provided for them in the desert what they needed to eat and to drink and how he protected them against uh, their enemies and how he went before them in columns of smoke and pillars of fire, how God did all of these things revealing more and more of the glorious wonder of who he was and yet 10 minutes in a sense. It's a little more than that. I guess it's 40 days and 40 nights. They're out of the presence of Moses who had been the mediator, their their go-between, this great God and their own lives. And just a short time later, they are losing their focus on him. 
they're starting to forget who the great and glorious God is. It's a great reminder that we always need to be careful in the church to focus much more on the master than on the pastor. Think about that. Churches today around our country are in crisis because their pastors have proven to be people of clay feet or have done something awful. And, and it suddenly the heart and the faith of the people are shaken. What if all along they'd only looked at the pastor as a, a very human intermediate and their real rapturous delight had always been in the master himself. And because their pastor, Moses, is gone for 40 days and 40 nights, the Israelites get very disoriented and, and, and they lose their focus and they ask uh, Moses' assistant, Aaron, to make them some new gods. And in a hugely stupid moment, Aaron says, okay. I, I just would love to know more about the encounter between Moses and Aaron after this moment. Why does Aaron do this? We're not explicitly told in the text. Maybe he sees them as a restless mob, and they were very restless, who might just lynch him if he didn't do something to satisfy them. Maybe Aaron is a little bit like Pontius Pilate in that moment of encounter with the mob in Jerusalem who were crying for the blood of Jesus. And even though Pilate knew that Jesus was innocent, was innocent he said, well, I'll beat him. I'll have him beaten then just to appease the crowd. There's some evidence in the text from Exodus that that Aaron thought that if he just satisfied them, appeased them for a moment, he could bring them around again. And you see him after a while trying to set up an altar to the holy God in front of the golden calf. Trying to refocus Israel upon God. Parents or bosses, have you ever been there? Have you ever had a moment where you just gave in? You surrendered your standards? You thought, oh... I just, if I just let them have what they want this one time, I can steer them back. How important it is to remember that these little exceptions we make in all these various areas of our lives have consequences. Either way, Aaron has the Israelites give them his gold jewelry. He melts all the jewelry down. He fashions a golden calf, an idol that gives them a, a new focus since they've lost their focus. And they begin to dance around and worship this, this golden calf. And remember, it's important to remember at this point, the Hebrew people are not a bunch of well-educated stockbrokers, lawyers, and entertainment producers. They're a rabble still. 3,500 years ago, many people still lived with primitive pagan instincts. Some time ago, I, I was on a trip, uh, a pilgrimage tour to, uh, through the footsteps of Paul with a group of folks in this church. And one of the stops along our journey was at a, at a lesser visited church on the outskirts of Rome. But this particular church had as a special feature a very magnificent statue. It was this one. It was carved by none other than Michelangelo himself. And I will never forget the emotional power that this statue conveyed. This was a larger-than-life depiction of Moses as he has just come down from Mount Sinai. He has the stone tablets in his arms, you can see. You, you, you can see his head starting to turn. And what Michelangelo is capturing is the moment that Moses sees the Israelites worshiping a golden calf. Moses has just been in the presence of the glory of God and they are worshiping a golden calf. And you can note his right knee turning in the statue. And if you're up close to the statue, you could actually see the muscles in his calf tensing as he's about to spring up from his seat 
and go postal on the pagans. He, he is just, it's too big. This apostasy, this, this error of judgment, this dimu, diminution of, of focus and purpose in life to go from the glory of God to the worshiping of this mean idol. It's just a betrayal of God and of reality and of even the people's own well-being. That's, it's almost too big. And Moses smashes the stone tablets on the ground, the Bible says. And in chapter 34, he will have to go back up on the mountain again and get a second copy. Thank God for second chances. God photocopies him. Another set of these commandments. And in the meantime, Moses unleashes a brutal judgment on the people for their unfaithfulness. He conducts a purge, really. It's a sober reminder of how much God hates idolatry. Idolatry among God's people is still a problem. And you've heard plenty of messages from preachers through the years railing against it. They complain about all of our fascination with money, power, celebrity, etc., etc., etc. You've heard those messages. I don't need to repeat them. Those are forms of idolatry for sure. You can probably think of, of the many ways in which you are tempted to honor and seek and serve things above God. We can all come up with our own list. But as Pastor Lee Eklov observes, our greatest threat may not be the little golden gods of TV and leisure and work or money. Our greatest threat may be the great God, the Lord God Almighty, El Shaddai, Minimized. Minimized. We may not deny God outright, says Eklov, but we too often let our view of God grow small, like our snapshots of the Grand Canyon, or, 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 or like a Mount Rushmore paperweight. Do we even notice that the image of God we hold is so much beneath the glory of God who actually is? We must constantly work to recover and to respond to the reality of God whose glory is too big to be conveniently boxed and whose glory is too good not to inspire us to change things about our lives that aren't good. We must constantly work at this and that's, that's our task every single day when we get up in the morning and we go out, Lord, today, let me not take you lightly. Let me not take the wonder of what you've done and what you've given me lightly. May I not regard as too small the privilege of taking this next breath of honoring you in all the conversations I'm going to have and the spending decisions and the interactions I have with difficult people. Will you allow me in some way to reflect your radiance in this day of life? This is what it means to worship God. And, and Christian witness is simply worship walking through all of the corridors and pathways of life. I think that God knows how fickle and distractible we are. I don't think it pleases him, but I don't think it surprises him. I think he understands that without regular encounters with his glory, even the most earnest of us will have this tendency to lose our focus at times. And so in the last chapters of the book of Exodus, we see God laying the foundations 
of an almost mind-boggling plan. If you've been reading along in the book, then you know that one of the ways that God has been revealing himself to the Israelites and reassuring them that he has not forgotten him, them out there in the wilderness is by holding regular encounters with Moses and his people at something called the Tent of Meeting. There's a lot about this in the latter chapters of Exodus. It's a literal tent. It's a canvas tent. It's a structure that got set up outside of the Israelite camp where God showed up regularly with his glory and displays enough of himself to steady them and to direct them. And Moses would go out regularly to the tent of meeting and the people would go out and they would stand around the tent of meeting. They were external to the tent of meeting, but they knew that God was there and it kept them on track. And, and it became a, a place of, of security and guidance. After the golden calf crisis, God enacts stronger measures. While meeting with Moses on Mount Sinai, God imparts to him detailed instructions for the construction of a physical space called a tabernacle. A tabernacle was intended to be a place where God and his people could relate on an even deeper commitment level. The tabernacle is larger and more elaborate than the tent of meeting. And in fact, the tabernacle's design incorporates the tent of meeting into its structure. And you can read about the design of the tabernacle in Exodus chapters 25 through 31. And you can read about its actual construction in chapters 35 through 40. In fact, there's kind of repetitive because you get the ins design instructions and then you hear it being done exactly as it had been designed. What's important to know is that like the Passover feast that commemorated God's sacrificial practice for delivering Egypt from bondage, or rather Israel from bondage in Egypt, like the Passover feast, the tabernacle becomes one of the great constants in the life of the Jewish people. Lots of other things change. The scenery changes in their life. But the great constant are the Passover and the tabernacle. And, and all of us need great constants in an ever-changing life. Which is why the practice of worship is such an important thing for all of us. It's, it's where we are touching the great constants the truth of the creed, the wonder of God in worship. You know, what are the great constants in your life? For the children of Israel, the tabernacle went with them wherever they went from here. As they journeyed toward the promised land, and now they actually leave the foot of Mount Sinai, and they begin to go towards the promised land itself. Uh, you can read about the rest of that journey, by the way, in the book of Deuteronomy. It doesn't get contained in Exodus. But each time they, they, they finish camping in one place, they tear down the tabernacle, they pack it up, they carry it with them to the next location, and they set it up again. It's always with them. Whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, that was the sign, it was time to go they would set out. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day and the fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites during all of their travels. Now what I want you to notice is that by God's command to Moses, this strange structure, this very big tent, larger than that tent of meeting, is filled with significant symbols. God gives very specific instructions about these symbols to Moses in the construction of the tabernacle. When someone entered the tabernacle, the first thing they encountered was an altar. It was a place to, to offer up a sacrifice of an unblemished blemished lamb. And the tabernacle reminded people 
that we can come close to God only through a blood sacrifice that atones for our sin. The next symbol you would meet if you entered the tabernacle it was a wash bowl. Uh, e every Israelite was, was um, required to, to pass through those cleansing waters in preparation for encountering the glorious God. Next to the wash bowl was a table that was called the bread of the presence. The bread of the presence. It was a symbol of God's gracious provision for his people as they had escaped uh, slavery in Egypt and as he had supplied them with manna in the wilderness and, and, and quail to eat. The, the table of the presence reminded them of God the provider. And illuminating the entire tent was a huge seven-branched lampstand, or menorah as it came to be called, that was made from the 75 pounds of solid gold that had been surrendered by the Egyptians as Israel had left the land of their bondage. A lot of it had been turned into the golden calf and then the golden calf was melted down and turned into this magnificent lampstand. And the lamp represented the light and the life that God gives to his people. And in the inmost place in the tabernacle, in that sacred location behind a veil known as the Holy of Holies, was a wooden cabinet, a structure made of wood known as the Ark of the Covenant that contained the tablets of the Ten Commandments, the word of God to people. And this wooden symbol was also known as the mercy seat. Now I hope you're taking all of this in and really considering its meaning and starting to draw some conclusions. Let me ask you this question. What do you think are the percentage chances that not just one or even a few of these symbols and all of this language might come together 1,500 years later in the life of one person. To paraphrase Pastor Newt Larson, when Jesus came into our world, he said a number of things that strangely line up with what we read about in the book of Exodus. He said, I am the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. Think of that altar in the tabernacle. I am the living water. I am the living water. Drink from me. Be washed by me. Think of that wash bowl in the tabernacle. I am the bread of life. Remember the table. Remember the bread of the presence. I am the light of the world, said Jesus. Remember the lampstand. I am the living word, the divine logos. Remember the ark of the covenant. And then Jesus alone offered people forgiveness at a mercy seat fabricated from common wood. Maybe that's all just coincidence. Maybe all that just, you know, coincidentally lined up. Kind of like the mathematically improbable, if not impossible, circumstances that led to life on this little planet. Sort of like the billions of unique convergences that had to have happened for the genetic material that is you to have come together so that you could be sitting here 
part of this conversation. But if that is not enough, here is one more remarkable confluence to think about. We conclude our study of Exodus today. We turn next week to another story, a story we pick up in uh, the gospel messages, a message that the Apostle John summarized like this. And the word became flesh and made his dwelling amongst us. And we beheld his glory. And the word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory, says John. Do you know that the Greek phrase that we translate as made his dwelling or dwelt amongst us is built on a much older Hebrew and Aramaic phrase that literally means he pitched his tent. He tabernacled amongst us. What John was declaring is that the glorious being who came close to Israel and who guided them on their journey, made a decision to come even closer, closer still to human beings. He tabernacled among ordinary people for 33 years. This time the divine word, the logos, the great power at the heart of the universe that holds all things together, even the Greek philosophers believed in such a thing. This divine word entered into the tent of human flesh. And he did so that not just Israel, but eventually the whole world might behold his glory, might discover his life-changing goodness. If we go into all the world and make disciples of all nations and telling his story, and I hope that as you journey with this people, you're discovering more and more of his glory, more and more of his amazing goodness, though it's too big for anybody to really fully describe. But as we're going to see when we return to start the Advent season next week, wise men and wise women still seek him. And if this series has been wild, then I think you're going to find this next one is going to be magical. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for your amazing, life-changing word. And for the word that became flesh and chose to tabernacle amongst us. Continue to enter into our lives, we pray. Enable us to make a home for you, for something of the glory that you are. And may the radiance of our encounter with you, even this very day, show upon our lives, show in the transmuted goodness of our lives as we go forth and in the encounters we have with all of the precious people of this earth. For we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Would you stand as we close today? This is holy. This is holy. You are holy, you 
Touch your presence, fill me now as I wait upon you now. Come on, we sing, this is holy. This is holy, this is holy ground. You are holy, you are holy God. Yeah, this is holy, this is holy ground. of the radiant glory of God and is my hope and prayer for you that, that you might be that radiant light of Christ as you go into the spaces of your life this week. If there's something that was stirring in, in you from something Dan said or something going on in your life that you would appreciate prayer for, we have our prayer banners right over there. If you're online, you can drop in the chat, I, I need prayer, and someone from our team will join you in that way. If you're new and want to hear more about the life of the church for Christ Church in Five, I'll be in front of the platform in just a moment. And if you want to help us um, help families in this community by purchasing gifts for our Four Christmas initiative, you can do that online as you leave this place today. Now, I know, friends, go from this place as the radiant glory of God's light and love in each and every space that you go into this week. Go in peace. Amen. Amen.